made this conference very pleasant. But I also want to really say thank you to all of you for coming. It's quite a big deal to resume in-person conferences after two years of COVID. And I really think that this um, carrying on the tradition of FIPSAC is an important way for us to rec all recover together. So thank you all for coming. So I want to talk to you today about a pattern avoidance criteria for smooth positroid varieties. This is joint work with Jordan Weaver. Um, Jordan would have liked to be here too, but she's doing an internship this summer at Microsoft and taking a week off and that wasn't going to work very well, but she might be here on Zoom. I hope I can't tell. Um, our work is recently posted on the archive in case you want to take a look at the full 50 page version of it. And the slides are posted already on my website in case you want to download them as we go. All right, so I wanted to start off, first of all, with a quote I would prefer to be remembered by <laughs> than the one given yesterday. So this is my definition of combinatorics. Combinatorics is the nanotechnology of mathematics. And I think of this as um, what we do is sort of looking at any kind of mathematics, but we care more about the intricate, delicate little structures that control all the details. And every kind of mathematics is amenable to combinatorics this way. So the outline of the talk is, first of all, to talk about the motivation for the problem that we are solving. We are interested in pattern avoidance on decorated permutations. And then I'll define positroid varieties for you. These are relatively new objects in the literature. Uh, the main theorems are about characterizing smooth positroid varieties. And we have some enumerative results. And I'll end with some open problems, things that we're still thinking about, things that maybe you'll be thinking about. OK, to begin with, what's a decorated permutation? So it's very similar to a regular permutation in SN, except that on every fixed point, you must assign an orientation. So either it goes clockwise or it goes counterclockwise. And it makes sense to think about a decorated permutation in terms of an arc diagram, which unfortunately I tried to blow up and I maybe made too big at the bottom here. The idea of the chord diagram is that you put the numbers from one to N around a circle. The edges in the circle don't matter. So they're kind of grayed out. And then you put an arc from I to WI for every I from one to N. And because you have put an orientation on every fixed point, you will, at that fixed point, you'll either put a little circle clockwise or counterclockwise. So you can see I have a fixed point at eight that got its orientation. There's also a fixed point at six in this particular one. And you can't see it, but it's down below. Okay, so you could represent a decorated permutation by the chord diagram or by its two line notation or by its one line notation. Those would all be equivalents. Right. So uh, back in 2006, Sylvie Cortille was working on the Q enumeration of the Eulalia numbers. And this is a very nice piece of work that she did. Um, she was looking at um, Q enumeration with respect to alignment numbers and weak exceedances. And this builds on work in the totally positive Grassmannian um, that was done earlier by Lauren Williams and depending on work on, of Alex Posnikov's. And in this 2006 paper of Sylvie Cortille's, she had this question at the end, can we define generalized patterns for decorated permutations? And this is referring to pattern avoidance, and you've probably seen a lot of work on this topic of pattern avoidance in permutations, but it doesn't obviously generalize to decorated permutations, because if I take a subsequence in a decorated permutation and then restrict it down to a smaller one, uh, the fixed points don't necessarily map to fixed points. So it's not obvious exactly how to do this, and um, so Jordan Weaver was looking around for a thesis problem and she picked up on this question and we started generating some ideas of how you might do pattern avoidance on decorated permutations and um, looked for things in the OEIS that would match. We have a couple of different ways of defining them. And some of them work out very nicely, like you get a binomial transform of Catalan numbers in one way for link three um, pattern avoidance. But, you know, there's lots of different ways we could do it. We didn't know which one would be best, which one would be most useful. And so we went back to the source to try and find some application. Is there something that we could characterize with a new form of decorated permutation pattern avoidance that would be relevant in context? And so it made sense to go back to the totally positive Grassmann cells and see what we could do there. And so this was sort of the beginning of Jordan, thesis, Jordan Weaver's thesis, is are there interesting families of decorated permutations avoiding certain generalized patterns? And this is very much inspired by the work of Lakshmi Bhai and Sandhya, who are two women Indian mathematicians 
who um, who proved that the Schubert varieties that Patricia Klein was just talking about, they are smooth if and only if the permutations indexing them avoid two patterns, 4231 and 3412. So it's a very nice char characterization that's actually inspired a lot of the work that I've done over the last 30 years. And um, so we were hoping to find something similar here. So and we, we've succeeded. So to tell you the story about positroid varieties, let me just review a little notation and background on Grassmannian varieties, first of all. So the Grassmannian varieties have points which correspond to the k-dimensional subspaces of an n-dimensional vector space. Um, for this talk, we're working over the complex vector spaces, c to the n, and k will be some number between 0 and n. And if I were to hand you a k-dimensional subspace, I probably wouldn't give you the whole thing. I would probably just hand you a basis. Right. So if I were to get to give you a basis, I could take the coefficients of that basis. I could take the coefficients of the first basis element in terms of like the E1 through EN. And I would make that the first row of a matrix. And then I would take the second one, make it the second row of a matrix and so on. So every K dimensional subspace could be written down as a K by N matrix, full rank K by N matrix. Of course, every subspace has different, many different bases possibly. And so it doesn't really matter which one I give you. So we can think of the Grassmannian variety as the quotient of the K by N full rank matrices modded out on the left by all invertible K by K matrices. Okay, so those cosets are in bijection with K dimensional subspaces in CN. And one of the nice things about Grassmannian varieties is they embed into projective space via the Pluker coordinates. It's a, the Grassmann varieties are always smooth. They're actually manifolds. They have lots of nice properties. So let me tell you about this Pluker coordinate embedding. So uh, one thing that you might do, and it's an invariant on the cosets, GLN mod the matrices, is you can consider computing all of the K by K determinants that you could get by taking all K rows and any subset of K columns. And if you wrote down the columns in lexicographic order, let's say this would give rise to the Pluker coordinates of a particular K dimensional subspace. And the, the map will be well-defined provided that you go to homogeneous coordinates, right? If I multiply on the left by some invertible matrix, I will just rescale all of the determinants by the determinant of that matrix. So as a, as a homogeneous coordinate, this makes sense on the level of um, Grassmannian variety points. Okay, so that's how you get the Pluker coordinates. So let's look at an example. Here's a matrix, two by six matrix. I wrote down every single determinant that I could, two by two determinant. And you get a bunch of zeros in the beginning, of course, because of the two zeros in the first column, but then you get three times one and so on. Now, where does this Pluker coordinate have zeros? This is what to pay attention to. The zeros occur in certain spots and the non-zero ones occur in other spots. So I wrote down here the non-vanishing coordinates. This is a collection of sets that sit inside the size two sets of the numbers from one to six. I'll use this notation, square bracket six, to mean the numbers from one to six. And when you choose two, that means size two subsets. Okay, so these are the non-vanishing coordinates. And this is closely associated with the corresponding matroid. So the realizable matroids could be defined like this. So you, given any matrix, K by N matrix, full rank, then the set of bases for the corresponding matroid are just the set of columns, size, size K subsets, where the, the Pluker coordinate does not vanish. So I'm defining a matroid in terms of its bases. I could have also kept track of the complementary set. These are the non-bases. These are the places where the Pluker coordinates are zero. If you know one, you know the other. All right. Okay, so what's a positroid? This is a very special kind of matroid. Uh, this was defined by Posnikov, and it is the special case when you have a matroid, or sorry, when you have a matrix, a K by N matrix, and you get all of the Pluker coordinates are non-negative, like that special one that we saw in the last slide. So if it happens to be the case that you have a matrix that has all non-negative Pluker coordinates, then the corresponding matroid is a positroid. Now, what if I try to go in the other direction? You hand me a bunch of subsets of size K, and I'm supposed to tell if it has, if it's a positroid or not. How am I going to do that? Well, one way I could do that is I start running through every possible K by N full rank matrix, and I check its Pluger coordinate. And when I'm really lucky, I'll find one that has an all positive 
Fluker coordinate, right? Or all non-negative. But that's a real needle in the haystack kind of problem. Instead of doing that, actually, Plesnikov found there's many different things that are in bijection with positroids. And thank God he did, because otherwise, how would we ever find one? In fact, actually, he says, if you have one of these nice combinatorial objects, he can totally parameterize the matrices that will have those non-negative Pluker coordinates. So the Postnikov, and then a little bit of it had to be added by um, Suho O, uh, the positroids are, are in bijection with decorated permutations that I just told you about, and with Grossmann necklaces, and with certain intervals in Bruja order in the symmetric group. And these are what I'd like to call Grassmann intervals, building on the theme here. Um, these are intervals specifically where V is a Grassmannian permutation. And uh, K here is keeping track of the rank of the positroids or the number of anti-exceedances of the decorated permutation or the size of the elements in the Grassmann necklace. For the, in terms of permutations, a K Grassmannian permutation has the first K numbers in V in one line notation are increasing. And then the last K minus N, sorry, N minus K numbers are also increasing. You might have a descent in position K. And then anything that's below V in Bruja order would count as a Grassmann interval. These are all in bijection with positroids. Okay, so where do these things fit into the bigger literature? So these are very important in the theory of totally positive part of the the Grassmann varieties and cluster algebras and soliton solutions to the KP equations. And they have nice connections with statistical physics and integrable systems and the scattering amplitudes that Hugh Thomas was telling us about this morning. So there's really, it's connecting to a whole tremendous amount of mathematics. If you haven't seen this subject before, let me recommend Lauren Williams ICM talk as a good place to start for background. Uh, she gave a lovely talk and the paper that goes along with it is a great resource. It talks about some of the history and some of the big players are Lustig's 1994 player paper, sorry, Connie Reish's 1998 thesis, Fomin Zelvinsky, of course, Kodama Williams, and then this long list of physicists and the P is for Alex Posnikov. Okay, so what's a positroid variety then? So if you have a positroid, then you naturally have these Pluker coordinates sitting around, some of which are zero, right? The, the ones in the complement of the, of the positroid are saying these particular Pluker coordinates are zero, and those are the ones you should use to define your positroid variety. So a variety in general is just a set of solutions to some polynomial equations determinants or polynomials in the entries of the K by N matrices. So these are some polynomials that you force to vanish, which other matrices in the full rank K by N matrices also have those vanishing spots. Well, that's a, that's a positroid variety. In general, actually, if I give you an arbitrary collection of subsets of size K in one through N and ask you, say, those Pluker coordinates are equal to zero, what kind of variety is that? That's called a matroid Schubert variety. And those things are actually pretty wild. You don't, we don't know a lot about them. They have a lot of structure that has been really hard to tame. These somehow, these positroid ones are very special. And of course the Schubert cells, Schubert varieties in the Grassmannian are the ones where you say a particular um, coordinate is not zero and everything else before that are zero. So those are special too. Okay, so here's a positroid variety, right? You could compute one if you want. Um, Knuts and Lambspire have a different way of defining them. It's equivalent, and it's also very nice. And this is related to what Patricia Klein was talking about. She's, if you look at the full flag, complete flag variety, it sort of sits on top of the Grassmannian variety. It corresponds to the invertible n by n matrices. And you can project it down to the Grassmannian just by taking the top k rows. And in there, the Richardson varieties, which are the intersection of two Schubert varieties in opposite position, when you project down one of those Richardson varieties, you get a positroid variety. So this is another way of thinking about it. Same objects. Okay, so let's go back to the example. So we had a matrix A. We had written down all of its Pluker coordinates. It's easy enough to see where the zeros are, right? Uh, everything that starts with one, but then also two, three, and four, five in case you don't see the indexing. So what does this positroid variety look like? This would be the collection of all two by six matrices where you have to have zeros in the first column. The second column could be arbitrary. The third column has to be linearly dependent on the second. The fourth column can be anything. The fifth column has to be linearly dependent on the fourth. And the sixth column could be anything. Anything like that, that that's what your positroid variety is. So 
good enough. Now, it could be the case, like the sixth column could be arbitrary, so it could be two zeros. So some of the Pluger coordinates can, some additional ones can vanish, but we're saying at least these vanish, corresponding to where the positroid elements are. Okay, so that's what they look like. And now to talk about our main theorem, I need to explain what is a smooth point versus a singular point of a variety. And in case you haven't seen this before, you probably just take a variety out of your pocket like this, you know, here's a variety. And um, every point on this variety is smooth, right? I mean, I run my finger across it, it's smooth, but also it has the property that if I were to look at the tangent space that corresponds to any point on this variety, it would be two-dimensional. And the variety itself, this thing is hollow. So this is a two-dimensional variety. The tangent space dimension matches the dimension of the variety. If I had a pinch point or a place where two irreducible components come together or something like that, then I would have a singular point in the variety. And you could measure that by looking at the tangent space. The dimension of the tangent space would be larger there, strictly larger than the dimension of the variety itself. And there's a nice gadget that we can use to find these singular points. Yes? Uh, but this is not a positroid variety. Don't be confused. This is a real variety. What, and do you call it, what do you call it? Uh, it should be called a variety dessert, I guess. <laughs> Jahangiri. Okay, we have to find this tonight. Okay, so to help with the computations of what's the dimension of a tangent point at a particular point in a variety, you know, like, how do you compute that thing? Well, tangent spaces go with derivatives, right? That's the natural thing. So if you have control over the equations defining a variety, let's say a variety is defined by F1 through Fs, then the Jacobian matrix has rows indexed by F1 through Fs. The columns are indexed by all the variables that are possible. And the entry in I comma J is this polynomial derivative of fi with respect to xj, all first derivatives. And when you want to know the dimension of the tangent space at a particular point, you evaluate the Jacobian at that particular point. Now you have just a matrix with complex entries. You compute the rank, and that will give you the co-dimension, not the dimension of the tangent space. OK, so a computation is straightforward for every particular point. Of course, there's an infinite number of points on your variety, probably. So it's still a needle in the haystack trying to find where is it singular. But you have some equations. You could another variety that you can set equal to zero. And so we did a very meticulous calculations with the Jacobian in order to come up with this theorem. So this is the main theorem with Jordan Weaver. And that is, if M is a positroid, and you have these associated objects, the decorated permutation that goes with it, the Grossman interval that goes with it, UV, then the following are equivalent. Our positroid variety, which I could index by any of the bijectively equivalent elements, is smooth if and only if the decorated permutation has what we call no crossed alignments. This is our analog of pattern avoidance. And I'll explain on the next slide what a crossed alignment is. Or it's equivalent to that the core diagram of the decorated permutation is a disjoint union of spirograph permutations if you look at connected components. Or the positroid itself is a direct sum of uniform matroids. A uniform matroid is just when you have all possible size k subsets of one through n. So it's, it's not hard at all to go from the bottom up to the top. If you have a direct sum of uniform matroids, that's like saying the positroid variety is a direct sum of Grassmannians itself. They were all smooth, so the direct sum becomes a product. They, that one's smooth. It's a union of spirographs. That's actually pretty easy. So it's easy to go up. The hard part is to go down. And actually, we prove the contrapositive. We prove that if we have a cross alignment, then we actually explicitly find a point where the variety is singular. OK, so let me explain these patterns to you. Um, our proposal is that instead of patterns in one line notation, you should think of patterns for decorated permutations as sub pictures, sub graphs of the chord diagram. So, one of them is the alignments. This was already in Alex Posnikov's 2006 famously unpublished paper. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend reading all of the parts that are there. There are some parts that are missing, <laughs> but it's a fantastic paper. And the alignments play an important role. So what's an alignment? This is just when in the chord diagram, when you have two edges that go off in the same direction, more or less, 
you know, they kind of point off together in the same way, like these two yellow ones that I've highlighted. Um, this is an alignment. If they go in different directions, but don't ever meet, then that's uh, a misalignment. Of course, sometimes, you know, you have some flexibility how you draw these arcs, but you should draw them so they cross minimally. Sometimes you're, there's no way around it. The arcs will have to cross, and that's a crossing. That is a kind of pattern, right, that you should pay attention to. And then the one that you need to know about for this talk is the crossed alignments. So this is three different arcs, two of which form an alignment, and a third arc that crosses both. Simple enough. If you have this pattern, like we do here, you have a singular positroid variety. If you avoid that pattern altogether, it'll be smooth. Ah, okay, so you can define this carefully in terms of the arcs. So if you take one of them and you look at where it is, this arc, uh, if you were to go backwards, you see the tail first and then the head. And of course, in terms of computer programming, you have to be very careful about arc, the arcs and everything is done on a circle. Okay, so do you understand the, the definition of a crossed alignment? Yes, no. Three, five, three to five and five to seven actually cross. And um, so I have a vertex here and you should think of it as a fat vertex. So this, this arc coming in actually touches the arc going out. Uh, I'm sorry, three, five, and then six, eight would be a misalignment. Yeah, so so um, that would be a misalignment. Actually, the harder ones are sometimes with the fixed points. So uh, six to six, is that aligned or misaligned with five to seven, right? This is actually a, a misalignment, but four is aligned. Yeah, you have to look at it with the right lens. Sorry? So that's right. So cross alignments can never have a fixed point. So in terms of detecting smoothness, it, one of the things that we did right away is to just delete all the fixed points and say you have a smooth one if and only if the fixed points um, just vanish. They don't matter. Another thing that we had to prove is that you can rotate it and it'll be smooth if and only if. You can also flip it on the vertical axis and you can reverse all the edges. We think of this as a corresponding to some group actions, right? You have rotation, flip, and inverse. Flip is like conjugating by W naught. No, three, five, and six, it looked to me like an alignment. Yeah, okay. Okay. I also wanna tell you about spirographs. These are another family of patterns in chord diagrams. It's an infinite family. And the name spirograph comes from this game you might've had when you were a child that you draw these curves. Uh, there's a lot of nice geometry with the curves that come up these ways. So you put your pencil in this device and then you continuously track and it moves ahead exactly the same amount at each step. And so a, you could add one arc on one arc, you could orient it. And from then on, it would sort of determine the orientation on all the other arcs. So you could get a, a permutation that's of the form WI maps to I plus some fixed constant M. And M should, you should, I plus M, you should interpret modulo N. And M should not be N itself. So it can be anything from one to N minus one. Mm -hmm. So these are the spirograph permutations in the chord diagram, we just call a spirograph. So here's an example of a typical looking smooth positroid variety. This is the decorated permutation that would go with it. So underlying every one of these chord diagrams is some non-crossing partition, just breaking it up into connected components. And then, okay, the spirographs don't exactly look right when you put it on a non-crossing partition, they get kind of morphed in some weird ways, but you can check like on the green one here, it looks like it advances by two each time. Also notice that spirograph permutations are not exactly the same as the cycle decomposition, just being one cycle. So here are two crossing transpositions. And that's just by, in S4, you can take the spirograph, which advances everything by two. Okay, so that's what they look like, the smooth ones. All right, now I'm a little low on time, but I mentioned that the anti-exceedance sets are what's important. So if you have a positroid 
It's the size K subsets in one through N. So what is the K? If you look at the decorated permutation, it's the size of the anti-exceedance set. And these are just the complement of exceedances you probably all know in regular permutations. The only funny thing to do is what do you do about the fixed points? You include the clockwise fixed points as anti-exceedances and counterclockwise are exceedances. And if you have your, your set, you can look at the two line notation for a decorated permutation and easily get to the UV notation if you just highlight the columns where there are anti-exceedances. So the thing above is bigger than the thing below. And so in this case, the anti-exceedance set is one, two, six, three. You could sort them in order. But wherever those columns are, to get the UV notation, just take those columns and shove them left. So shuffle them to the left. Now you have a permutation on the top row, which is increasing until the kth position and then increasing again after that. So it's necessarily a K Grossmannian permutation. And also all of the elements in the yellow are bigger than the thing directly below them. And in the white, all of the elements above are bigger than the ones below. And this is enough to prove that U is less than or equal to V in Bruja order because this is a special case where K is Grossmannian. So this is necessarily the, the right interval, interval to take. And if I have the chord diagram for W, you know, it would be the same chord diagram for U and V, right? I just map out the columns. The only thing I have to do is figure out the decorations, but the ones that are clockwise end up in the first part, the ones that are counterclockwise end up in the second part. So it's an easy bijection. So classically, we've got the positroid from the decorated permutation by going through this Grossmann necklace. Um, due to time, let me just leave that there as an example. And I'm going to say we, we ended up needing to go more directly. We need a really close connection between positroids and the Grossmann intervals. And so this is something that we needed to prove. This was known by some of the experts, Lauren Williams and Alan Knudsen, but I don't believe it appears in the literature. But the positroid is really easy to get from the Bruja interval. You just take, for every element in the Bruja interval, you take the first K letters in one line notation as a set, that's all it is. Okay, so this is easy. All right, so let's just quickly outline the theorem, the proof, because some nice things came up in the proof. So one of the most important contributions due to Posnikoff and part of it due to Knudsen Lamb Spire and like I mentioned, building on Connie Rich's work, the co-dimension of a positroid variety is just the number of alignments. So count those patterns or the, um, the dimension is length of V minus length of U. I wrote it in terms of co-dimension, but you can think of it in dimension too. So a corollary of this is that a positroid variety is singular at a particular point X, if and only if the rank of the Jacobian is strictly less than the number of alignments. So all we really had to understand was the rank of these Jacobian matrices, and we have really good control over the equations. Right? So in some sense, it's doable. And so an important theorem is instead of having to search over the entire positroid variety to see if there's a singular point, we, we look at the, what are called T fixed points. These are a finite collection of points that are very special. And if any of them are singular, then we'll have a singularity obviously, but if every one of those are smooth, then every other point will also be smooth. So we reduce it to a finite check, first of all. And what are these special matrices? For every element in the positroid, let's say J is some K element subset, you put in columns corresponding to J, put the identity matrix, put zero everywhere else. So these matrices have a lot of zeros. And that's what I call A sub J here. And we show that if you compute the rank of the Jacobian there, this, this is now making it much easier because you have all these zeros. So it's a lot easier to evaluate the, the rank of these matrices. It has a very nice enumerative formula it's gonna just be the number of elements in this special set. It's the set of all size K subsets of N, which are in the complement of the positroid that have the extra property that when you intersect them with our special J, they have size K minus one. So you, you take some element out and you put one element back in, right? These are very easy then. So count those up. This is the rank of our special point. And now we only have to test at these special points, is this less than the number of alignments or not? And the hardest part of the proof was figuring out exactly, once we knew that these ones with a crossing, um, cross alignment were singular, had that conjecture, you have to actually find a point where they're singular. And the thing to do was to think about your alignment as a boat going, let's say up. And then if you have a boat going this way, 
the right hand arm is the starboard side, the left hand arm is the port side. And if you sail, then it matters a lot. If the wind is coming over the starboard side, you have the rights over the other guys. So we, we arrange it so that we have a, a starboard tacking cross alignment. So, and if you have that and you rotate it, so the tail starts at one, then the particular thing is the, the anti-exceedance that gives rise to an actual singular point. And this is, this is then provable by very careful understanding of the Jacobian matrix. All right, so this um, statement, I see I need to close up quickly. So the statement led us to look at the Johnson graph. Maybe you've seen this before. This is a graph on size K subsets of the numbers from one to N, and you attach two subsets if they differ by one element. Um, if you restrict your attention to the induced subgraph corresponding to the positroid, then this graph controls all the structure. And I would like to propose, Jordan and I would like to propose, this is the analog of the Bruja graph in this theory which um, Jim Carroll showed. Uh, the Bruja graph is regular if and only if the corresponding Schubert variety is smooth. And we actually have the same thing here. So we'll add this to our list of equivalent characterization of smoothness. This induced Johnson graph is regular if and only if you have a smooth variety. And the, the vertex degree is length of V minus length of U. Okay, so there are some nice enumerative results. Um, this follows very closely to what our dealer Rincon Williams did for counting positroids and um, uses a theorem of Arnold Roland Spiker's. Just if you have a non-crossing partition and you impose certain structures on each of the pieces, you can sort of plug it into the formula and you get uh, a way of counting the number of smooth positroids. This is efficient enough that I was able to go up to about S300 um, if I had more patients. And you see from these ratios that perhaps it's looking like order constant to the end in terms of asymptotics. Um, I wasn't sure we'd converge just yet. So let's say C is less than or equal to six as a conjecture. Um, also from that formula, you can, you know, you have a composition of functions, you're picking out a particular coefficient. So you can use the Fa de Bruno formula to connect this to the Bell numbers. If you take the Bell polynomials and you plug in certain numbers that come from the number of spirograph permutations, we get another formula for the smooth positroids uh, in terms of K, a sum K equals one to N, and then these BN Ks divided by a factorial, this naturally leads to some kind of a Q analog, right? Counting by K, whatever K is. So we had to figure out what is K. K is counting the number of connected components in your non-crossing partition. Okay, so to conclude, um, some open problems that we are very interested in is uh, what else can you say about the geometry or the equivariant cohomology for positroid varieties by looking at the in, um, induced Johnson graph on the positroid? So using the theory of Goreski, Kotwitz, McPherson, we think this should be very important. Um, can you find the whole singular locus for a positroid variety? This might be very hard. It's hard for Richardson varieties, so warning, but it might be nicer for positroids. Um, we thought that there's a lot to be said about these flip inverse rotation groups for decorated permutations or for derangements, or actually the basic structures in this theory are the stabilized interval free permutations. And finally, uh, there's a lot about the common torques of the directed Johnson graphs for positroids that we still don't understand. So there's a lot more to be done. Okay. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh... Maybe one or two key questions. Thanks, Sarah, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I was wondering whether there's uh, any chance of getting similar criteria for smoothness of Richardson varieties. Yeah, so the Richardson varieties, um, we don't have a pattern avoidance criteria for. Um, is that Joskin and I have a criteria in terms of cohomology? Um, I find it hard to believe, but I haven't been able to reconcile that theory with the cr crossed alignments yet. So there's something, there's so many different, you know, W naught inverse conjugations that maybe this is all that has to happen, but somehow it's not quite working out. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. For the last question. Thanks for the lovely talk, Sarah. I was wondering if um, you thought about the, so instead, there's an equivalent formulation instead of decorated permutations, you can think about um, bounded affine permutations. And that seems like somewhere that you could 
you could expect like normal sorts of pattern avoidance. Like, it, did you look into that? For affine permutations? Well, yeah, but, but, but the, you know, affine permutations, there's, there's a, there's a bijection between decorated permutations oh. and, Oh you know, yeah, so affine. special special bounded yeah. affine permutations. Yeah, actually, that's a good good question. I didn't look there for pattern avoidance. Um, yeah, and partly because I guess we were thinking about how are you going to do decorated decorated permutation pattern avoidance. But maybe the class that's a good idea to look there with the classical one. I don't know how is there a pattern avoidance characterization of the k bounded affine permutations. That would be the first thing to check. Oh well, maybe. Yeah. Uh, due to time limit, we will move on to the next talk. So let's thank Sarah again. <laughs>